show is here. Yo, our mission is clear. It's time to change healthcare. Have no fear. Today is the day. This is the hour. Together, you know we've got the power. Drop the silos. We're all the same team. Experience, business, tech, and marketing. How can anyone be satisfied with the way things have always been? Yeah, we've tried. So join us now. Join the revolution. Consumer first health is the evolution. Status quo, more like status no. Yeah, this is the healthcare wrap. Y'all, come on, let's go. New choices, new platforms, new care models. In the healthcare of tomorrow, consumers win. But who will design it? What will it look like? And how long will it take? We're here to answer those questions with some provocative thinking about how to create the healthcare that people actually want. Ready to roll up your sleeves, look at the world a little differently, and explore the frontiers of consumer health together? Join us. This is the Healthcare Wrap. Hey, it's Jared Johnson from Shift Forward Health, and here's what's going to go down today. We have the flavor of the week about what else. Of course, we're talking about Amazon's new $9 a month, one medical membership for Prime members. What framework can we use to determine if this is a consumer-first service, and how can it accelerate our ability to create more like it? I'll talk about that. Then Zane and I build on our last episode and continue on the theme of digital in rural healthcare. We'll discuss how digital strategy can lead to better servicing patients in areas that have less access to medical expertise and facilities. Then we'll dive into how key leaders can come together to address existential challenges from workforce shortages to revenue recovery. It's time to dive right in. Are you ready? Let's go. Flavor of the week. It's prime time to talk about what consumer first products, services, and experiences look like. By now, there's a pretty reasonable chance that you've heard about Amazon offering one medical memberships to Prime members for $9 a month. Among the hot takes offered by experts and pundits, I also saw the Clayton Christensen Institute offer an assessment of whether this is a disruptive innovation. In their case, they use a six question test to examine things like whether it uses an enabling technology, whether existing providers are motivated to ignore it, and whether it targets people who are under or overserved by existing offerings. I like their conclusion, by the way, which is that the new Prime One Medical pricing offer is not a disruptive innovation, but that doesn't mean it isn't good. I also like the framework of asking these questions, so I'd like to start using something similar to help us identify what is a consumer-first product, service, or experience. This is a first version of the framework, mind you, so I'm interested in your feedback. And there is a slight bit of overlap with the Christensen Institutes, and that shouldn't be a surprise, because there's a good portion of this Venn diagram of consumer-centric offerings that are indeed disruptive innovations. Okay. So, is Amazon's $9 a month one medical membership for Prime members a consumer-first product, service, or experience? Here's my five-question test. First, does it address one of the key health and wellness jobs to be done for a significant consumer population, convenience, access, and affordability being the key three? The answer to this, as with practically every one of Amazon's healthcare offerings to date, is yes to all three of those. Second, does it meet this need or expectation in a better way than existing sick care offerings that are currently on the market? I'd say yes. Yes, knowing that every one medical member whom I know raves about the experience. Third, can it operate without adding burden to clinicians? I'd say to be determined on this one, and I even have a little bit of concern. I would want to wait and see if a sudden influx of patients jump at this new price point, and that unbalances the patient panels of one medical clinical teams. Fourth, is it attractive enough for consumers to understand the value proposition and hire it? I feel like this is where Amazon has a leg up on practically everyone in the healthcare space. No one, in my opinion, knows better how to package up a market marketing message in simple, easy to understand wording at just the right time and place to make people click and sign up. And fifth, is it sustainable and or scalable? Absolutely yes, this is Amazon. It feels like their current healthcare bets are closer to their sweet spot than ever before. And once they feel like they've hit that bullseye, they scale faster than practically anyone on the planet. So there it is. It looks like we're close to a firm yes here with some possible concerns about clinician burden being the only potential reason that they don't fully pass the test. Either way, being able to identify consumer first products, services, and experiences is one of the key consumer muscles that we need to build and using this framework can help us put in the reps. Let's spend more time distinguishing what makes offerings more convenient and attractive for everyday people and continue to refine this framework as we go. That's another way that we'll build the healthcare of tomorrow. And that's the flavor of the week. Hey, let's get into the flow. Zane, you're back. How you been? Hey, Jared. It's good to be back and have time to record another episode of the Healthcare App. 
We're getting close to like our 300th episode. Is that, am I keeping good count? Yeah, our last episode of this year of 2023 will be number 300. That's in, that's crazy. Oh my goodness. When did I start? Was it 200? No, it wasn't 200. It wasn't, it was 250. Can't remember. It was before 250, man. What? Okay. You're making me go check the old list. Time flies. Time flies. 143, Zane. Wow. Was your first one. That's crazy. Okay. Time flies. Yeah, it does. That was January 2021. No way. Hey, that's crazy. It was like it was just yesterday, and, <laughs> and we still haven't met in person. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that was like a little known fact. So we'll just let that out of the bag. I'm like, we were we were planning to. There were a couple of opportunities this year where where we thought it was going to work out, and then it didn't, and that's all good. So one of these years, though, I guess what this all demonstrates is that you actually can do good work remote. You don't always have to be in the same place or in the same building, and it's possible. Yeah, it's more than possible. <laughs> uh, we've been we've been able to do this for a while now. That's fantastic. So let's set up today's episode. We're talking about the state of, of digital in rural health. And uh, let's set this up. You just had a the an opportunity to attend an event here. You want to tell us where you went, who was there, and then we'll get into some of the insights that you heard there. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, luckily with my day job, I spend a lot of time working with health system leaders across the country. And, you know, one of them happened to be Sanford Health and was invited to take part in their the Sanford Health uh, Summit on the Future of Rural Health, Rural Healthcare. And this year it was very much focused on concepts around workforce. And it was hosted at their, call it, their corporate site in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which was the first time I've ever been out that way. And so as a good Canadian, to be honest, it felt like I was back at home, so to speak. It felt like a rural part of Canada where I grew up. And so it was nice to be there. And frankly, like maybe this is my own bias or not bias, my own slap on the hand. To be honest, like I didn't know a whole lot about Stanford Health. And so getting there and seeing the full breadth and depth and size of this leading rural health system in the United States was pretty, pretty fantastic. And so they're about, let's see, 44,000 employees. Uh, they have a 200,000 member health plan, which is significant. Nearly 3,000 clinicians in their medical group and really sites all across North Dakota, South Dakota, and I think Nebraska, if I got that right, don't quote me on that. But they're huge when it comes to rural health and spread out in a way typical health system leaders that we chat with on the show you know, could never imagine. And like I said, um, they hosted this summit, a day-long summit where they bring together, it's really close to call it the Sanford Health Community. And so it's by invite only. And they bring together all their partners. And so it's some of their technology partners, you know, some of their consulting partners, which you know, we are by way of the work that I do day by, uh, during the day. And then also some of the academic partners they work with. And most importantly, political leaders and policy leaders. And what Sanford Health is doing, which is pretty remarkable, is creating this platform through this event and through the work that they do and the work they espouse to do to help shape literally shape and make recommendations to government around what future, sorry, what the future of rural health can look like, working with everyone in their ecosystem. So it's really, really fun to be there for a day. And I think we've chatted a number of times on the show to our audience that I started my career off working in rural health in rural Ontario, that teeny tiny hospital. And so it just felt so cool to be back in that context and like, listen to I mean, people who I guess I don't know, almost call them my family, like the way they, they speak, the problems they had brought me back to my earliest days of trying to trying to be a healthcare innovator. And so it was a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. And rural has just come up a lot lately. So we had Brad Smith from Main Street Health just on a couple of weeks ago, a couple yeah. of episodes ago, which was great to hear how value-based care, at least one path for value-based care to fit in there and connect some of the dots when you're talking about rural health. And of course, geography and distance and fewer providers per patient population are continual things to address with rural. And those are things that will continually, I feel like, be at the top of the list. And yeah, just whether it's lack of access to technology. The, these are, I'm painting with broad strokes right here because I know these things are fluctuating a lot too. And and these are things that, that the more I learn from some of these recent interviews we've done, guests that we brought on, the more it's helping broaden my understanding. And we, we just had Jared Anzac last week from Sanford Health uh, talk about the role of digital and in, in particular with, with how that goes with, with some of the other things that are that are happening in between, like you said, a multi-state footprint and 
that's sometimes the case. That's not always the case with rural. Sometimes you're talking about a, a smaller number of geographies, which typically means fewer resources. And so I'm, I'm really curious to hear some of the things that just stood out right off the bat from the summit that they attended. Let, let's get into that. Sure. Well, a couple of things, and I should have mentioned it in the intro. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Sanford Health you know, has a beautiful corporate campus, beautiful open space. You know, there's tons of, there's tons of open space in, in South Dakota. But the event itself, Gerald, was hosted in something called the Sanford Health get ready for it, event barn. And so it is literally beautiful, like modern looking barn, very similar to like what you might see in um, an Instagram barn wedding. And so it's this beautiful event center on their corporate campus. And so you got to imagine all these leaders from around the country are here in this barn, full setup with lights and um, full setup with lights and media. And it was just fantastic. But to get into some of the insights, the event itself was focused on workforce. And so as you could probably surmise in rural health, it's even more difficult to hire the right, particularly clinical folks to come and work there. I should say as a remote employee, like I'd be more than happy to go to Sioux Falls and, and work from there. It's a beautiful little community. But for nursing and clinicians, it's incredibly difficult to uh, hire, bring folks into these small, tiny communities to work in the clinics and frankly, keep people around and engage them. And so that's why Sanford Health wanted to focus this broad topic around their event and see what people had to say about it. And so, like I said, Sanford Health brought in leaders from Washington and San Francisco and all part all parts of the coast to come and apply their thinking to healthcare. And one of them was um, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, who I believe was was part of the Biden administration or the Obama administration. Don't quote me on that. And he brought a lot of thought leadership and very provocative uh, provocative gentleman. He spent a lot of time talking to the audience about the secret to solving for ultimately value based care in the rural setting is really going to be getting back to basics and making sure that we're using primary care as sort of the quarterback. And so what he's essentially implying, Jared, is that so many health systems and really, you know, the industry at large, you've gotten so specialized, right? We're always talking about specialty, some random subspecialty that we're trying to innovate and focus in when it's that everyday primary health care that most Americans are in desperate need of. And so his opinion is that we, in rural, we need to be thinking about solving for primary care, primary health first, and then spend our time building up on the rest. He also spent a lot of time talking about, you know, how automation tools can be used to drop costs on the back end and enable clinicians and even administrators to do more and augment their job. And he's very clear that automation and, and by extension, things like innovations like generative, generative AI are not here to necessarily steal jobs, but to make FTEs more productive. And, I, and that theme came through loud and clear. As health systems think about implementing these tools, it shouldn't necessarily be about dropping your FTE count, but enabling them to do so much more and do much so much more in a safer way, in a more efficient way, and in a more repeatable way. And so we think about all those health systems that are on an HRO journey. Think about using automation and generative AI tools to align to your HRO, your high reliability principles um, as you're going down that journey. And then finally, which I really appreciated because I used to be an administrator in healthcare in a hospital system, is he spent some time talking about one of the fixes for healthcare maybe in general is really some focus around thinking about how do we actually remove complexity. And so we talked about how about one fourth of the spend in healthcare is related to some type of administrative spend, which also includes you know, everything in revenue cycle and on, uh, on the payer side. His view is that two things need to happen. There needs to be more simpler reimbursement models that we need to work with payers and government on. Keep in mind, there were some lobbyists in, in, in the audience, so that's why he spoke to that. But he referenced a McKinsey article, which I thought was really interesting. I haven't found it online. I should probably go Google it. But he said, one third of costs can be cut by intentional workflow redesign, which is an amazing call out to where automation tools and even like generate AI tools can start to help health systems by just rethinking the workflow, which I know is a huge thing that we talk through here. We don't want to digitize a poor workflow and just make things even worse. And so again, one third of costs in healthcare, according to this McKinsey article, 
could be eliminated by just workflow redesign. Go figure. And so that was kind of the opening panel. And I was taking notes like a theme with my pen and they gave a beautiful journal. So it was easy to do. Digging into workforce a little bit, most of the discussions I hear about workforce are on the clinical side. Uh, Was that the focus here when we're talking about helping FTEs become more productive? Were there other opportunities to improve productivity or what what are the thoughts on on workforce clinical versus non-clinical? Yeah, so it really was focused more on the clinical side. I mean, like I said, it's probably, it might be a little bit easier for them to hire administrators or people like us who technically could be a little bit remote and might actually want to go and work in some of these rural communities. Um, but when he talked about workforce engagement and how to do it, they brought up a number of, a number of concepts that really encouraged the audience to play with. But they said that the key to um, engaging the workforce, keeping them engaged is really someone did a study. And there are really three big things that surface to the front. The first is around social relations, which I never really thought about. And go figure, me being a very social person, I could see why it'd be true. But he said the one thing that actually keeps clinic clinicians working in organization or saying they want to continue to work there is the number of social relations they have within the organization. You know, the study talked about how, you know, even health systems that were just intentional about bringing clinical leaders together at the unit level, like on a shift to have lunch or coffee or pizza or whatever it might be, actually goes a long way to strengthen those interstitial ties to keep people feel like they're part of the team and their mission. And so his advice to health systems that are struggling, particularly in rural, around workforce engagement is to think about ways you can get, that you can create those, I don't want to say force, but create the environment where those social relations can happen more naturally. He also talked about, and this may not be a surprise to anyone listening, that autonomy is actually another big theme in workforce engagement. And so making sure that clinical leaders are at the table when decisions are being made around strategy, digital health, you name it, anything really, nursing. Back home in Canada, probably because nursing is unionized, nurses have a huge voice at the strategy table and, you know, program table, no matter what changes are coming to the hospital. When I first came to the U.S. and started working in American Health System, I noticed that that wasn't the case. We always had physicians. And so making sure that folks have autonomy, that clinical teams, in a sense, are self, are, uh, can help shape what happens in their unit to a degree is going to be very important to engagement. And then the thing that he said that almost made me jump out of my seat like I was at church or something is he said that it's so important for health systems to really drive mission with their clinical workforce. And he was very explicit to say that I don't mean the mission, vision, and values. What he really meant is the non-clinical mission that health systems fulfill in creating communities where people can actually live and prosper, which I thought was an amazing thing to basically take the corporate hat off and have a have a frank conversation about how hospital systems essentially are keeping communities well and alive. And it's that mission that we need to probably do better at is making sure that clinical workforce sees the connection as much as possible. And so those were some of the the highlights that I took from that portion of the discussion. That's interesting. When I think through just some of the kind of like the throughput outline, you know, where do we go from here on some of these issues? It's it's interesting because I don't know, I guess I pay attention to you know, how much are different topics being talked about and in what light are they being talked about? And it just feels like in general, again, we used to just be able to look at social media quite a bit and and see what was being talked about. And I feel like just overall, you know, for B2B, for a lot, a lot of spaces that we live in, for instance, I used to be able to see a lot of conversations happening on LinkedIn. And it just feels like those have kind of made like that frontline conversation, the knee-jerk reactions to things. It feels like there's just fewer of them overall. I don't know if you're seeing that, but it's great that you've been able to, that you were able to attend the summit, right? Because then you're able to still hear these conversations and it just feels like there are fewer opportunities. Like there, It does feel like there are more podcasts out there, for instance, but they don't last that long. They're either self-serving. It was just cool, I would imagine, for you to have been able to hear this panel directly instead of just trying to guess what people are talking about. That's yeah, great. I mean, just to get you know close to, I mean, most of my day job is we're working remote. And so, you know, sometimes it's hard to like feel like you're connected to healthcare anymore when I'm working for my condo here in Detroit. But so to be, you know, at the ground level with some of these folks, with nursing leaders, with physician leaders, just to hear firsthand in their space 
on their campus was pretty exhilarating. And one of them, Jared, just to bring it up, was um, we we're talking about the differences of value based care, kind of the way American health systems think about it versus more international, or I would say in Canada, how we would think about it. And they brought up a really good point is, you know, typically when we talk about value based care in the United States, usually innovations are largely focused on cost cutting. You know, whoever holds the contract in a sense, you know, can keep the difference. Okay, what a great model. But in more international circles, and I find this to be true in Canada, I have some colleagues at the NHS in the United Kingdom, and even some colleagues on in East Africa, when they talk about value-based care, there's certainly a piece of it that's cost about cost cutting. But what they really focus on is health outcomes, which really there is a difference, I think. I've noticed that, uh, that international folks outside the United States are really, really focused on measuring clinical outcome and impact where maybe we're not always doing that here in the U.S., also willing to implement, you see this too in Canada, with with how health systems are linked so closely to social service and other functions, other services that the government provides. And so perhaps here in the U.S., we just don't have the time or don't want to go through complexity of setting all those up, so we just focus on cost-cutting. Where outside the U.S., there's much more of a holistic focus around value-based care, both clinical and non-clinical. And I thought that was an interesting point to have been brought up to um, brought up to the attendees. Yeah, I like it. You're connecting a lot of dots here, right? It's not just so much of a focus on one a- aspect here that is neglecting others. Yeah. I saw a couple of other things on the agenda. I mean, of course, talking about physician burnout. Yeah. But then just talking about like the economics. One session I see was the economics of baby booms and busts. Oh my gosh. That was an interesting one. And so the whole premise of the presentation is we probably need to understand population booms and busts if we are to make predictions around, okay, how much healthcare is really going to be needed in any given location? What was fantastic is her presentation drove home. The the main point she wanted to drive home is that the reason for the baby boom, you know, back in the baby boom years after the war was not actually the war. Yeah, and I forgot the, the specific reason that she had mentioned. And then the reason for the bust was not necessarily that women were going to the workforce or whatever, which a lot of people believe, but decreased numbers of unintended pregnancies. And so as technology changed and social norms changed, you know, women essentially were having less surprise babies, right? And so that shaped the downslope that we see here today. And so it was really fantastic is really she just went through sort of the high level demographics, what we could expect and, and sort of like why that matters, which was a very macro way to look at healthcare, which frankly, I've never seen in a healthcare conference before. Usually we're so focused on tech and technology, but more from like a foresight strategy perspective, we're not actually using data to actually make some forecasts around what we could expect. And so really appreciated um, her perspective. And we'll have to add a note at the end of this, Jared, and the post show to mention her name and give her the credit because it was an excellent presentation. I was able to chat with her after her speech and she had mentioned that uh, this was the first time she ever spoke to a healthcare audience and she's so nervous. And I told her that was one of the best presentations on a topic that I thought was going to be so boring and she made it so exciting and interesting. Other people need to bring her in to give the same speech. Was it Casey Buckles from Notre Dame? That's her. That's her. Yep. Fantastic. It's funny when, I don't know, I've been to events and maybe they're just conferences too where they're digital focused. And so you get so down in the weeds and you're talking features and benefits ultimately about a platform where you're comparing platforms and something like that is so important. I don't know, being able to incorporate each of these things and connect some of these dots, talk about why you're not going to be standing here in five years wondering why we we missed the boat and, and projecting some of the the economics underneath our growth strategy or you know our population health or any other initiatives that you've got. So I love that they were able to tie in so many different things all together. One of the funnest things I did when we were there, Jared, is we ran into a fellow podcaster. Uh, Sanford Health has their own podcast. You should definitely go, our listeners should definitely go and listen, like, subscribe, and share. It's called Reimagining World with Sanford Health. And so I went and introduced myself and by way, ourself. And uh, our good friend, Courtney Colleen, uh, uh, who runs the podcast, invited me to record a few minutes with them. And so that was nice too. And so that that was the icing on the cake for sure. What I thought was wonderful about the 
event, and frankly, it's something we've talked about here before, is that rural health actually has the opportunity to lead in this whole notion of health systems innovation and design. Because they're rural, because their budgets are limited, and because of their constraints, it actually forces these systems to be innovative. And they just may not always have the budgets to talk about it, to go to conferences and let everyone at Vive and Health know how awesome they are. That's what the urban systems do. But the urban systems can learn a lot from what rural is doing because they have to do it. The other thing I'd say is that in my view and estimation, rural health and small community health looks more like healthcare all around this country and around the world than it does how we deliver care in these big urban and academic systems. And so in my view, to you know, quote the futurist who said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. If you want to see what the future is going to look like, I would keep tabs on what rural health systems are doing because that's likely where you'll find the evidence of new ideas coming to path coming to pass because it has to happen there. They're so backed against the wall when it comes to constraints. They have to do things differently. There's no sitting around and well, you know, we kind of have the budget to do this. We could maybe fix it that way. They're just too constrained. They have to do something different. And so it's very exciting to see uh, what rural systems are doing and also what Sanford Health is going to bring bring to the world here. What a great theme because it reminds me of if you're an, a solopreneur or even a small business owner compared to a large organization. And, you know, I've had the fortune of working for startups, of building up my own consulting practice on two separate occasions and working for Fortune 500 companies. There's a difference between what you expect if you just, if you know you're going to be able to afford the big platform or tool or technology or whatever it is, or high profile, you know, leader to come on board and, and help versus if you don't. There's a lot to be said for that. And I'm sure in some ways that can be likened to the fact that you have to innovate. You have to be willing to not accept the status quo and say, like, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. We have to figure out what we can do. Exactly. I will say, too, like, maybe I don't want to say what was missing because it was the concept was there. It just wasn't always called out. But it's this notion of collective impact. And what I think rural can offer the world is in these smaller communities where that hospital is probably one of the biggest employers and one of the biggest anchors in that community. And what I mean by that is it's simply, you know, how do we as an organization, as one institution, work with other institutions in the community that have a stake in the future health and well-being in the broadest sense? And essentially put all the problems in one bucket and map out all the problems this community faces. How can each of us who are within this community think about how do we connect to that problem? How can we possibly contribute to its solution? And then you layer on the money and we say, okay, of the budgets that we bring to the table, how might we think about designing mutually supporting programs, if, if you will, and strategies that ultimately work at achieving, sorry, at solutioning for the those broader set of uh, issues that we face in this community. I do think that we're all can demonstrate that through collective impact. And frankly, I would imagine we're going to do a predictions episode this year. I would say that collective impact models for creating communities where people can live long, happy, healthy, productive, and meaningful lives is going to be a theme of the future, so to speak. Love it. And yes, we do plan a predictions episode this year. So <laughs> stay tuned on that. It's been such a pleasure to catch up and, and dig through some of these topics. These are things that thankfully aren't going away. They'll probably always be on the radar screen. It's great to hear where where things are and where opportunities exist. You know, you and I like to look at solutions, opportunities, instead of just sitting here and saying, look, everything's broken. So, so I love that. It's, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, thanks for connecting here. We, that's, that's a wrap for this episode. Stay tuned for each episode coming up here. We have some great ones coming up. And if you haven't tuned in, like Zane said, we're coming up on episode 300 just a few weeks from now. So we appreciate everyone. That's crazy. Thanks so much for uh, for joining me today, Zane. Hey, thanks for having me, Jared. And kudos to the Silver Health team for putting on an amazing event. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.